Yeah, that's one of you. Come on. How many are ready to worship the King of Kings? Can you guys just lift your hands to heaven? Father, we welcome you in this place. We love you. Lord, we set our mind on you today, God. You said if we draw close to you, you draw close to us. And so, Father, we're choosing this morning, regardless of what we feel, God, we're drawing close to you. And we thank you that you draw close to us, too. And everyone said amen. 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 All right, let's go. with me your love your love is greater your love is stronger Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Awakens me. Yeah.
If y'all just set your hands to heaven. Father, we welcome you in this place. Come meet us here. This morning we set our attention. We give you our affection. Our eyes are locked on you today, God. Can you guys do that with me? Lord, we lock eyes with you. King of kings, lover of my soul.
I don't, I try not to come up, you know, in the middle, but I just felt like sometimes I know God wants to do something particular in a certain song. So would you just close your eyes and picture this? When, when the prophet first shared that, we're actually singing scripture there. And when a prophet shared this, it was, it was actually not to a person, but it was to a group of people, the people of God, the people of Israel. And he was making an incredible promise that he was going to lower the mountain, flatten the mountain, raise the valley so that his will could be done. And so I'm going to ask Elena to lead us in, back to this bridge. And we're going to sing this. And as we sing it, I want you to realize we are singing this prophetically that God can prepare the way to do something incredible in your life. And as I was standing there singing, I felt like there's, for some of you, there's like this heaviness and actually it'll be addressed in the sermon too, to believe God for this big miracle, this big thing to be changed, this mountain to be moved, whatever it is. Um, I'm telling you, when we start to pray in line with God's heart, because this is prepare the way so that what? That, that King Jesus, that his kingdom happens. And when we suddenly start getting in line with his heart, God does incredible things. Can we just lift up our hands and let's just pray like a posture like this, like, God, make, make your values my, in fact, why don't you, we say this, if you're following Jesus and you're uh, maybe a part of this church family, you're, you're comfortable with praying a prayer like this, say, Father, make your values my values. Help me to think like you think. Prepare the way. As I sing this morning, prepare the way. As I speak and come into agreement with the will of heaven, prepare the way at my job for salvation. Prepare the way in my family for salvation. Come on, raise your hand if you have family members that you know need saved. Come on, we're going to pray this. We're going to sing this again. Prepare the way. And as Elena leads us, I want you to be imagining Jesus is able to do what you have been unable to do, right? That we're unable to do in our effort. Amen? Let's sing that. Prepare the way, prepare the way, Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way.
I've got nothing new So how could I express All my gratitude And I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must say we worship you. Would you just lift up your hands to him and just worship him? Come on, just tell him that he's worthy without, it, without any lyrics or 
melody or anything, God, we lift up our voices to you. We worship you. We honor you. God, we thank you for these hallelujahs and these melodies, God, that you give to the church at large, God, and, and we worship you with them. But right now, God, we praise you. Come on, church, you can do better than that, Rock of Grace. Lift up your worship to King Jesus. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Go ahead, he loves to hear you sing. He loves to hear you tell him. Jesus, we worship you, we adore you, King Jesus. There is no one like you, no one like you, Jesus. God, we worship and adore you. Maybe you haven't done this in a long time. Come on, church, let out your praise. He's worthy. Something happens when you let out your praise. Something happens when you tell your soul, like David said, we just sang about it. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. Sometimes your emotions lie to you. Sometimes your emotions and your feelings lie to you and, and, and your emotions tell you God is late or God is not hearing you. Come on, praise Jesus anyway. Praise the King anyway. We worship you, Jesus. We honor you, we honor you, Jesus. We worship and adore you. Cause you are wonderful beyond compare, Jesus. Jesus, we worship you. And if I can just teach you for a minute, if you're new here and you say, well, like, man, is it just like hype? It's not, it's not hype. We, we love Jesus. And yet his word also tells us that sometimes our feelings or our heart is heavy. And I felt that as worship started this morning. I don't know if you felt, maybe even felt that in the room. That you can have a heavy heart, but then be reminded, well, this is what the power of worship is when you start to declare the goodness of God, what happens in your life is exactly what happened in David's life when he was writing Psalms and all these other guys. We're, we're worshiping, you put your attention on Jesus and suddenly your problem seems smaller and your God seems bigger. Amen? Amen? Turn to somebody and say, God's good whether you feel like it or not. Come on, he is. Tell another person, somebody that was not in the car with you. Somebody that was not in the car with you. God's good whether it seems like it or not right now. Well, good morning. How is everybody doing? Yeah. 
All right. Well, great. Well, welcome. We're so glad all of you are here this morning. What a beautiful weekend. We're just glad that you're here worshiping the Lord with us. If you are a guest, we just want to say thank you so much for coming. Um, we would just love the opportunity just to be able to say hello, um, put a face to your name, and there's a couple really simple ways to do that. Um, if you have a smartphone, you can use that. Uh, you can pull it out. The number is up on the screen. You can text new at ROG. The number is 94000. Also, in the seat back in front of you, there are some little cards that say, Let's Connect. That's an, uh, another very simple way just to be able to fill that card out, hold on to it. At the end of service, if you walk right through these doors to the main foyer, uh, there's a big green wall there. Um, we would like you to take your card there. Our pastors will be there. They'll be able to say hello, and they actually have a little gift for you. Um, but the heart here at Rock of Grace is that we are leading people to follow Jesus together. And the other thing about that is uh, we're also learning to follow Jesus together. It's a, it's a lifelong journey, and we would love for you just to join in with us. So uh, a couple things. I'm just going to uh, let you know what's kind of going on on the calendar. Uh, if you want to mark your calendar for June 23rd, uh, that is the next date that we are meeting for our starting point. And you might ask, well, what is that? Well, if you want to get involved or serve or um, find out different ways to be able to volunteer or you just want to know more about the church, uh, you will want to start at starting point. So mark your calendar for that. The date is up on the screen. It's every fourth Sunday. All right. This Wednesday night, uh, it is our conclusion of our Wednesday night discipleship groups. If you've been attending, uh, it's been an awesome time of learning. Uh, but this Wednesday, we are going to end with a worship night. So if you have not been here, that's okay. You can join in. We're just going to worship the Lord together Wednesday night. So come on out and join us. Um, something fun is going on in downtown Warren. Uh, our Warren campus is going to partner with the city uh, of Warren. They are doing Chalk the Walk. It's just a super fun event for kids and families this summer. Uh, one way that you can get involved is you can go to the store. You can go to the kids' aisle and find the really big, fat packs of chalk Pick one of those up for us, drop it by the foyer uh, area, and we are going to collect those so we can pass it out to all the kids and families that actually uh, come to this event from downtown Warren. Uh, this is just another great way just to be able to connect with them, um, get to know them, have fun with them. Uh, oftentimes, that is the best way uh, as a door to just to be able to share the Lord is when you can get involved in their life, right? All right, so something else fun. Um, VBS this year is going to be a family experience. It's called Kids Blitz. So moms, if you're looking for something to do with your kids that will be fun but also be meaningful, go to Kids Blitz. It's going to be awesome, and we have a video for that. So if you guys want to run that. So much fun. Our families were super engaged. The energy was at the highest I've ever seen. People went home energized, happy, and full of Jesus. As a former children's pastor, I know the importance of providing environments for the whole family, but I also know that that's easier said than done. That's where Kids Blitz comes in. What does that look like? I'm glad you asked. We use games and crowd participation to present the gospel throughout the event where we teach biblical truths. We also do an invitation, and it never gets old to see how God uses Blitz Ministries in the lives of families. We would love the opportunity to partner with you and your church to reach your community with the gospel of Christ. It's going to be a fun time. Uh, that's been ever, uh, it's been explained like this. It's like Dude Perfect. Any of your kids watch Dude Perfect? They have a lot of fun with that. So come out uh, June 22nd. Hey, we're going to uh, ask the ushers to come forward, receive our offering, and then we're going to get into the word. Man, are you guys just excited Sunday? I, I love coming to the house of God, and there's always, even when I was a kid, and especially like in Bible college, there's, there's just something about knowing that God has something he wants to share with us. Isn't that neat? Can we just open up our hands and just like asking God, Lord, to share this with me? Lord, whatever you want to share with me today, God, my heart 
is uh, wide open. I'm excited to hear what you want to teach me today, God. My heart is open. And God, I pray also over this offering that every dollar, God, uh, that would just be blessed and multiplied, Father, that you would continue to accomplish your will in Trumbull County, that we would continue to see every child given a safe and loving home. God, that people would become believers, that believers would become disciples, and disciples would become disciple makers who lead people to follow Jesus together. God, we know that only you can do something like this, a vision this big. God, we know that you can do it. So, Father, make us just um, people, vessels in your hands. Father, uh, I pray that you would flow through us. Lord, especially as we end the sermon today, that if there's things you want us to be thinking about, I pray that our, our hearts, our minds would be open to consider those things. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, um, I'm just doing a, I'm doing a two part series um, from one of my favorite books uh, in the Bible, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I've been, I started a book on this about three years ago. It's almost done. And so I wanted to condense some of these thoughts into two weeks. Ask, think, imagine. Can everybody say this with me? Ask, think, imagine. One more time. Ask, think, imagine. And I want to set this up for you. Paul was preaching the gospel. How many of you guys have heard of a man named Paul who used to be Saul? He used to kill Christians. How many of you guys have read that part of the Bible? I know. How many of you guys read the Bible and you're like, ooh, violent? Anybody? Right? So it was a different time back then. And um, they, they did not, the Roman government did not like it when you did not listen. And so uh, this is the same Roman government, right, that, that crucified Jesus. And now Paul has this experience, his name was Saul at the time, but has this experience with God on the road to Damascus. His life has changed. How many of you guys realize if you were um, knocked off your donkey um, by the glory of God, your life would be changed? How many of you guys, you were like, I don't even have a donkey. Let's just, let's just start over. How many of you guys would like, if you were knocked out of your SUV, come on, with the presence of God, how many of you guys think your life would change a little bit? Okay, so this happened to Paul, and, and, but now after he's preaching and he's planting churches and he's doing this apostolic work that God has called him to do, he is, is not always welcome in, in every city. In fact, one of, my, one of the most inspiring things you're ever going to see in the Bible, shocking things, is even after Paul is beat up in one city where he planted a church, he wants to go back. And so how many of you guys realize that the gospel can propel you to have a lot of courage that you would not have otherwise? Uh, because the kingdom of God, uh, man, I'm not even in my introduction yet. I'm just excited to preach today. All right, I better get to my notes. This is going to be a long day. Otherwise, you buckle up. Turn to your neighbor and say, buckle up. Let, it, let the food burn. All right, just kidding. All right, Paul is letting, Paul is writing this from uh, a jail cell. Now, before I even get to, to my notes, I got to tell you, if I'm in prison, if I'm in prison, if there's, if there's shackles on my hands, Right? And shackles on my feet. Cold, steel shackles in a dark, damp prison. I probably would not be thinking about you. I'm sorry. I love you, but I would not. And anybody else be throwing a little pity party if that was you? You'd be like, God, why am I here? Come on, God, why'd you let me down? Anybody else? But here Paul has had such an encounter with Jesus. Don't miss that. Such an encounter with Jesus... See, when you have encounters with Jesus, your priorities change. Had such an encounter with Jesus that he's able to think of others in the midst of a jail cell. It's crazy. All right, now I'm going to preach. All right, open up your Bibles to Ephesians 3. All right, and we're gonna, I'm going to actually, sometimes I give people like, if you have a couple bookmarks and those, those ribbon things in your Bible, you can also put one at Matthew 6. And if your Bible's really fancy, and you got like three of those, Put one on Hebrews 4. All right, so Ephesians 3, we're going to cover Matthew 6, and then Hebrews 4. And as usual, I'll put the scriptures on the screen as well. Before we read from Ephesians 3, I want to set this up, though. This, this week and next week is about the power of prayer. About the power of prayer, this gift of communion that God has given us, this gift to come to him and boldly ask him in a childlike way what's on his heart or what he wants to do in our lives. And then when he speaks to us, to actually follow through on it. 
And, and I, I personally think that's, that's maybe one of the biggest hindrances to this l- last great awakening and revival is Christians using this gift of prayer and taking, taking advantage of this gift. So ask boldly. Look at, look at Hebrews 4. It's defining Jesus. Since we have a high priest. Everybody say high priest. All right, that's Jesus, okay? High priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. So when you have a need, Jesus has often already been there. When you have a temptation, he has already been there. This is why I love Tim Keller says, only in Jesus can we say, you too, you too have been betrayed. You too have had a great need. You too have had a need of a place to lay your head. You too, right? So in our great weakness, we hold to this confession who Jesus is, that he can sympathize with us, that he did not just instruct us from heaven, but he came down as a man. Are you thankful for that, that he came down to live as we live? That's phenomenal. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. To the throne of grace, draw near, not to the throne of judgment, not to the throne where God's going to just tell you everything that you've ever done wrong, but to the throne of grace. This is phenomenal that God is this kind, that we may receive mercy and grace to help in a time of need. And by the way, it's not just grace to overcome a weakness or a difficulty. It's grace to do the thing. That's why Paul later, when he's teaching on the gifts, he calls them grace gifts. Everybody say grace gifts. So the grace upon your life to do the will of God. How many guys want the grace upon your life to do the will of God? I was talking with a pastor last week, and he was was thinking, man, I don't know if I can do this. And I said, I'm telling you, if God has spoken to you about it, that means there's a grace upon your life to do it. God enables you for every good work. It's the same thing I've told foster parents who, who have told me in the foyer, we're thinking about fostering, but I really don't think I could ever do that. I don't think I could ever give the baby back after taking care of it. You know what I've said every time? And I'm sure Nicole Cox and every other family and the Perkins, all, all the other families have said the same thing. When God calls you to do it, guess what? You're suddenly able to do it. You're able to love that child, whether it's three months or three days or three years, for the betterment of that child. And it's hard, but how many of you guys realize, and I see some of you foster parents smiling, right? Yeah, because it's hard, but guess what? He gives you the grace to do it. Isn't that powerful? It's phenomenal. All right, think about this. Ephesians 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Man, can you imagine being able to write like that from prison? Oh, my goodness. My, my prison letter would be like this. Dear God, help me. Right? And here, <laughs> that you be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and le- and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. This is one of my favorite passages to preach from. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ever ask or think, and NSRV says it like this, ask, think, or imagine, According to the power at work within us, everybody put your hand on your chest and say, within me. God's power wants to work within me, okay? To him be the glory. So does God want to do something powerful and used to, so that, so that you become famous and that you get all of your wishes? No, so that he is glorified. Amen? Here's what I want you to hear. God is able to do so much more than we could ever fathom. In fact, I would venture to say to you that the thing you're praying for is probably way too small. That went over like a lead balloon, so I'm going to try this side. The thing, I don't know, but these guys, they're just like asleep over there, so I need you guys to act like really like Pentecostal. Can you guys help me out? So you guys are like the spiritual bunch, these guys... Apathetic losers. All right, we're going to try this over here. All right, so here we go. Ready? The thing you're, does that inspiring, Jason? You're going to give me a hard time about that on Monday, aren't you? All right. The thing you're praying for is likely way too small. 
Donnie even yelled, preach. She went old school, preach. Somebody bring me a handkerchief up in here. No, I don't need one. All right. Let me say it again because this is the heart of the whole sermon. So I really, you can't miss this. The thing you're praying for is probably way too small. God is, God is able to do more than you could ever ask or think or imagine. That's phenomenal. It really is. And to drive this point home, you need a revelation of sonship, okay? So I was at the park with Lucas. This is about two weeks ago, and I wanted to share the story with you because the minute it happened, I'm like, oh, I'm using that during the Ask, Think, Imagine sermon. This is how pastors work. Everything goes through the filter of sermon, like, oh, I can use that on Sunday. Um, we're, we're in the park, and we're at Imagination Station. How many of you guys have been there? Right? We were just there for the park, actually, right? The Sunday at the park. So this is about two weeks ago, and he comes down this big, wide stainless steel slide. And he looks up and he sees this branch that's easily 30, I mean, it's 30 feet. It's w really high. And he goes, Dad, do you think if I jump really hard, I could touch that branch? And I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to crush his spirit. But I was like, probably not. But go for it. <laughs> Maybe I'll throw you, right? His imagination, you see, a lot of us have grown up way too fast. You have a mortgage now. You have bills now. How many got bills? Come on. How many guys got a mortgage, right? Right? The, the root word there is death, by the way. Mort, mortuary. It's, I mean, yeah. So how many of you guys have, like, you know, you're a full-grown adult now. Like, the only thing you can, like, as long as your grass is, you know, mowed, you know, responsibilities taken care of. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? Right? Amen. I know. Some of you men, you felt the spirit on that. <laughs> how many of you men get a little too passionate about your yard? I see. I see you, Seth. I see you not. Seth, I've never seen you bear such witness while I'm preaching, man. He's like, perfect lines. You got things to do now, Pastor Jordan. I don't have time. I don't have time for an imagination. I, don't, I, don't have, I, got, th I got Bill. I have, I have employees that, that are on payroll that, man, if we, I have this, I have that. I love what um, Picasso said. He said, everyone is born an artist. The struggle is staying one. And this is a son of a preacher, by the way. I studied his life one day. He's a son of a preacher. He said, everyone is born an artist. The struggle is staying one. How many guys would just slip up your hand if you're like, you know what? I've probably been adulting too long. I've lost some of my childlikeness, Right? So that's what we want to recover in this. When we face a dilemma, let me say it real bluntly. When we face a dilemma, an issue in our life, why in the world would we not bring it to King Jesus, who has the source of bottomless wisdom, and ask him for help? This is what prayer is. We're asking God like a child. I, I want to reach that branch. God, can you help me? I, I, God, I have this need in my life. And the crazy pastor up there was telling me, you actually care about this. Can you talk to me about this? Can you give me wisdom for this? How many of you guys have ever needed wisdom? And maybe like a job decision, different things going on, maybe something at work, interpersonal things, right? We face dilemmas at work. How do I make amends with this guy who blamed me last week for that project failing? How do I get the customer base up 20% like the boss is insisting that I do? I just had a, a, a story cross my mind about a month ago. I shared this really cool video. Some, this guy had posted a testimony, and I don't, I don't even know what church it was, but he was in a prayer. He was in a service like this about prayer, and he, he asked God boldly to, he said, God, would you, would you grow um, my sales by 20%? And God did it in like, in like a day. And he's like, well, God, would you? And he came, he said, the next week, he's like, would you grow my sales by, by 50%? Because we, me and my wife, we really want to be debt-free in 10 years. And if we can do that in the next year, we'll be, we're just going to give to missions. Like, well, he, it grew in like a, a week. Like that week, the boss came in and was like, what's going on? And so he, he kept praying these wild, insane prayers. And God just kept answering them right away. And he was laughing. He was giddy. He goes, our house is paid off, and we just gave 5000 to a missionary. <laughs> and he was, like, laughing. Let me try that over here. All right. 
Let's try over here. All right, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Stand up, right? Stretch. Everybody over here too. Stand up. All of us. Come on now. It's rainy and decaf this morning. How many of you would like God to answer your prayer so wildly that you laugh with giddy like a child? All right, now you're with me. All right, sit down. Okay. I had to get you with me. You see, here's what happened. And I wish I had that video because it just crossed my mind and I wish I had thought of that. But his heart came into alignment with God's heart. And that's a big key to Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be given to you as well. He started to care about what God cares about. Amen? Okay, when we face a dilemma, a problem, how do I make men's, uh, um, when we face a dilemma at home, why would we not go to King Jesus? How do I make amends with my spouse? All we do is argue. How do I get the kids to do the dishes? Or in my case, how do I get my toddler out of the mud and back into the bath? These are the real issues at the Beale House. All of these things can be brought to God. Amen? And again, it doesn't matter what the, the thing is. God does care. When we have an idea or a venture that we are considering, why in the world would we not go to King Jesus, the source of all bottomless wisdom, and ask for help? And by the way, I'm using the same words on purpose. When we have an issue or a dilemma at home, why don't we stop, put your phone away, it's a big key, <laughs> and engage the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. He's with you. In fact, when you look up that word where, where Jesus says in chapter John, he's with you hand in hand as a counselor. That word is arm in arm. He's with you there to give you wisdom. I believe just about every venture we take with God, God's version is often larger than ours. Why? Because he wants to, he, he wants to do miracles. Right? Ask from a place of identity. Ask from a place of identity. I have a couple life verses. One of them is Matthew 6, 33. I've used it from this pulpit so many times that when you seek first the kingdom of God, all of these things will be given to you as well. Seek first him and his righteousness. What is it that's going to please Jesus? What is it that's going to propel the kingdom of God forward in your life? See, ironically, so many people worry about all these things. And then on Sunday, they consider the kingdom of God. But King Jesus has to be at the center of your life. That's what following Jesus is, where he's at the center. Amen? So ask from a place of identity. When Jesus is teaching on prayer, he says, when you ask the Father, he's not going to give you a snake. You know, when, when my son Lucas comes in and he asks for Cheerios, Right? Or in, in Lucas' case, he crawls on the counter like a raccoon. Does anybody else have a toddler that does that? Like I just come in and he's just like, just going up to like Spider-Man. He's fully expecting, I'm, I'm not going to say I, I have a roach for you, right? I, I, have, a, I have a rat for you to eat. No, I'm, he knows I'm going to give him something good, right? And, and yet that's so simple. But Jesus, I love Jesus' sermons because they're so simple. He's like, hey, that's what prayer is like. Seek first the kingdom of God. Care about the things of God. And ask the Father. Everybody say Father. Right? So from a place of identity of, of you are his child. You're his child. And he is a generous, loving Father. But a lot of us, like that picture, we have a lot of things going on in our mind. And sometimes our perception of him as Father, and we'll leave, this is a sermon for another day, but our perception of him as Father is skewed. So we don't have the confidence to ask. But we need the revelation of how good he is as father. Amen? And that's what I'm trying to do this morning is tell you he is good father. He's perfect in all of his ways. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than them? Which of you by being anxious and by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Do you know that the stats for millennials and Gen Z for being on anti-anxiety uh, medication is just skyrocketing every single year? 
Do you know what this generation needs? Matthew 6. Why are you worrying? But go to the Father who's going to take care of you. This generation needs a revelation of God as Father. Amen? Who will take care of them. Right? Especially as they're becoming an adult. They're 21. They're 23, 25 now. And and they don't know how they're going to afford groceries. Right? They need a revelation of him as Father. Whatever it is that God has put on your heart, come to him boldly. I felt prompted to share that uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick, I was there a part of his, uh, a part of the revival that happened in Florida. In fact, that's where Pastor Jason and I met. We went to the same school. He had asked with childlike faith for God to pour out his spirit. He, he had heard about the Wales revival. He had heard about what happened in Toronto. In fact, his wife had gone to Toronto and experienced revival. And he said, God, if this is real, do this right here in Pensacola. And after days and weeks of consistently praying, childlike asking God, God did it. In Father's Day 1995, you can go on YouTube and you can watch the videos. It's phenomenal. The presence of God overwhelmed Pastor John that he couldn't even stand. And he's a big guy. He couldn't even minister. Right? The guest evangelist, uh, Steve Hill, he could hardly minister. People started to get saved left and right. I remember uh, Dr. Martin telling us in class about about the strip clubs that closed. How many guys know God's moving when all the strip clubs are closing and they're and they're coming to church? I want to see that in my city. I want to see our city transformed. We got to ask boldly and consistently and like a child imagine what is God's will for your life but again a lot of us are so busy but we we don't imagine we don't think through what I have to do in order to live by faith if we want to see revival we have to think through I need to allocate time to pray for revival and it's not I'm not saying there's like some quantitative you know you have to pray for 45 minutes every single day I'm not saying it like that, but we do have to allocate time and our priorities to spend in the presence of God because revival always starts with me. Revival starts with you. It's not just some thing that just like God just doesn't. No, it starts with us saying, God, I repent of all my sin. See if there's any wicked way in me at all. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I want to glorify you in all things. That's personal revival. And when you have a 250 people have personal revival and 120 people at our new Warren campus have personal revival, guess what? Suddenly you have revival in the city. Suddenly you're praying for the sick. You're doing everything Jesus tells you to do in Mark chapter 10 and Matthew 28, and you have revival. Amen? I love how Ephesians 3.20 and the New Revised Standard Version includes the word imagine. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. And we're going to talk about that word a lot next week. But imagine. Ever say a word imagine? The more you realize that you were made in the image of God, the more capable you are of imagining with God. The more you realize that God gave you this thing called an imagination. Guys, think about the the bird, he, he makes his nest. He does what God made him to natively do. The beaver, he builds the dam, right? The horse, he goes in the stall and does whatever else. Right? I've never had horses. Right? Okay. But here's the point. Humans are different. How many of you guys are human in here? Just... Okay. Any like sort of crazy bots or AI crazy people? Okay. As a human, you know what makes you uniquely human? Your ability to imagine. Your ability to imagine a future and then create it and put the steps in place to create it. That's a large part of what makes you human. How many of you guys are thankful that God made, made you human? I mean, that's an interesting thing to say in a sermon, but <laughs> I'm glad. The imagination is a powerful thing. It's so powerful. So your imagination affects the words you say. And the words you say 
creates the world you live in. Let me say again. Your imagination affects the words you say. And the words you say affect the world that you live in. People often live in a self-fulfilling pro uh, prophecy, whether good or bad. Amen? I wish you guys, I hope you guys are grasping this in your heart because it, it's, it's, this is something that has been changing my life the more I've thought about this this last few years. Look at this, Colossians 4, verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Be watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray. So continue to pray. Pray also that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. So he's praying. He's praying with the goal of the gospel being preached. He's praying with a seek first the kingdom mentality. You see that? He is praying in alignment with the heart of God. By the way, when you ask, I added this line this morning as I was reviewing my sermon. When you ask, how many, let's just start at point one. How many want to ask more boldly and more often? Okay, that's point one. You got point one now. Okay, awesome. Now, when you ask, be careful. Don't assume that God will answer your request exactly the way you anticipate. Right? Because sometimes people ask something. God's like, awesome, I want to do that in your life. And then he asks you to work with somebody that you're like, I have to work with him to accomplish that? Right? I'm preaching better than you're amening. Okay. Some of you are like, you ask for something, and then God wants to work on your character while you're stepping into the thing. And then you're like, eh, I don't really want to work on my character, so maybe I just won't do that thing. Because in every new season, a new assignment, there comes character tests. And there comes a, a sanctification process that the Spirit is making you more like Jesus. So know that God wants to work in you and through you in every season of your life. All right, point number two. Here we go. Think through what you have to do. I have to tell you, Pastor Jason, I got to tell you. Pastor Ed, I got to tell you right here. If there's one thing that I would say like, I'll use the word motivates, but it drives me crazy. Okay, I'll use the word motivates, though. In pastoral ministry is how Christians will pray for something, but then not think through what they have to do. Okay, so let's, you want you, a lot of Christians are like this. Father, I just pray that you bring that you bring me a job at Menards. God, I've been praying for this job at Menards. Lord, I pray that the manager of Menards just comes to my house and he just, he just knocks on my door and he puts a little letter in my mailbox. And Father, I thank you that it will be anointed with gold glitter. And I thank you that in that moment, that worship music will play, Jason will hit the highest note he's ever sang, which is probably an H sharp. And angels. <laughs> angels too, Lord. I need some angels. Right? I remember praying for a guy one time. Oh, um, I shouldn't tell a story. All right, I'll keep going. No, I'm going to tell a story. So he's like praying for this promotion. He's praying for this job. And I said, great, what, did you apply? He goes, no, man, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I said, bro, I love you, but you're kind of acting like an idiot. Like that boss is not coming to your house. Like sometimes I'm not very pastoral. I know I just meant to have a, Ed, Ed was it? So, like I'm just, what was his name again? Den Denny? Denny, yeah, just warning. Sometimes I'm not very pastoral, like. Sometimes I just take the shepherd and I just, poof, all right. Although that's needed. Am I right, Pastor Ed? Something that's needed. Just poof, pull him in. And I remember I looked at this guy. I'm like, bro, I'm not praying for you until you apply. After you apply, I will pray for you. I will pray for favor that the conversation you had <laughs> will go well. <laughs> that was great. He never came back. But anyway, <laughs> I lost him. He never came back. I, trust me, I know exactly who this is. And he never came back. But anyway, sometimes people don't want the advice they need. All right, point number two. Think through what I have to do. Can everybody say this with me? Think through what I have to do in order to live by faith. Say it one more time. Think through what I have to do in order to live by faith. You know faith is active, right? It's never passive. I want you to look at the work going on in this right here. So, so. Paul, that same guy, is writing a letter to the church at Corinth, and he's describing the works that everybody does a different kind of job, and he's actually addressing his interpersonal issue where they are fighting over who, 
who baptized them, and they're doing the classic immature thing of like, well, this pastor is more spiritual than that pastor. So he says, it doesn't matter if it's Apollos or Paul baptized you, right? But listen to the word work, because I want you to notice that. What, what then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered. God gave the growth. How many of you guys realize God gives the growth? God works through you as you're simply faithful, Okay? So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, but each receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. He's giving you these metaphors to help you picture it. According to the grace given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and then someone else is building upon it. Right? So let each one take care how he builds. No one can lay a foundation other than that which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day. We'll disclose it. And that means the day of the Lord. Other translations will day of the Lord. Because you'll stand before King Jesus and everything you did will be proven as valuable or not. Worthy of eternal, right, significance or not. It will be revealed by fire. The fire will test all of the work we have done. And we said, oh, man, he used, he used the, the curse word, the W word, work. Listen, I said this one time, and I'll never forget. I don't remember what church I was in, but I remember the feeling I had. I, I've, never, I've never had so many furrowed eyebrows. So I was preaching from Genesis, and I remember I said this, that God put Adam in the garden. He told him to cultivate it and to work before sin. And that work, there's a meaning and a joy that comes in cultivating what God's given you. And the whole crowd was like, almost like, I'm never going to work. <laughs> I just need God to give me a hammock in the shade. <laughs> right? Do you know, although I do like a hammock, right? But there is a joy in doing the thing God made you to do. And if you, don't, if you don't realize that, you will miss out not only on building God's kingdom and giving him glory, but joy and a sense of meaning in your life. God put Adam in. He was cultivating the garden. And look at this. He says, if anyone built, that's a lot of work. He used the word work, right? Apollos worked. He watered. God gave the growth. Paul planted the church. Apollos watered it. God gave the growth. God did this through them. As we, they were obedient. So think through what plans you have to do. I, I remember we had, we, had, uh, we had just stepped down from um, youth pastoring, and which was a huge, huge step of faith. And, and it was a decision I really struggled with, to be honest with you. I really loved it. And I remember we're at this, we're at this event with uh, these pastors, and we go up, and this lady named Jan Painter had prophesied, and she was moving really powerfully in the prophetic and I'll never forget, she totally reads my mail, describes music, describes our kids. I mean, it was just, it was insane. How, how many of you guys have ever received a, a prophetic word sometime, and you're like, did God email you? Like, how? Come on, raise your hand if you've ever had that happen. Yeah, almost all. So this is one of those moments. And she gets to the very end. She's like, and I'm going to give you properties. And I'm, and I'm like, what? Because that was not on my radar. So then I, I remember talking with Danielle. We're like, we have to now, we got to pray about what is our responsibility, right? Because see, what we actually do, you know what's not in the Bible? Have you guys ever heard this phrase? If God speaks to you, just put it on the shelf. And then if it comes off the shelf, that, that is bad theology. Come on. That's like, that's dumb. I have never read in Ephesians, put it on the shelf. Has anybody ever read that? Lonnie, have you ever read that? Listen, Lonnie's a great, Lonnie? Is one of our new elders. Come on, somebody, give him a hand. And I know Lonnie knows the word. Lonnie, have you ever read the scripture? If God speaks to you, put it on the shelf. Me neither. But why do we do that? Because it makes it easier to disobey. It makes it easier to be like, I don't know, that's scary. That's a new thing. So now what we had to do, we had to think through what do we have to do? So I started reading books about it. I started listening to podcasts, started driving through streets, started thinking about it and learning about it, and, 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 and then it grew. But God has to, God wants to take what he wants to give us. He wants us to do something with it. I'm going to give you a couple examples just so you can really understand what I'm trying to say. 
I, I met somebody, um, or I didn't meet them, rather. I, um, a, friend, a pastor friend of mine told me about his good friend who loved video games. I mean, he loves video games, and, and I personally don't love video games, so I don't get it, but he loves video games. It'd be like if you love to play the harp. I'd be like, great, I don't have a harp, but he likes video games. And he asked God to use him. Well, he made a video game ministry. And even as I heard this, I was like, mm. <laughs> have you guys ever just like, mm. and here's the thing. He kept winning every, everything, every round of gaming. And God told him to preach the gospel while he's like shooting at people in the games. I know, that sounds like so odd. Does, anybody, does that sound odd, right? Guess what? He grew to millions of followers. And he preaches the gospel to all these young adults and teenagers as he's, like, fighting them. He's literally a video game missionary. I'm not kidding. He's an Assemblies of God video game ministry missionary. I've never heard of such a thing. But guess what? There was not a church in Macedonia until Paul got a vision and he did it. You follow what I'm saying? There was not a war on campus until we said, hey, this building that's been empty for three and a half years, I believe, I imagine people walking in and getting saved. Come on, you see what I'm saying? So use what God has given you and start to imagine what you could do with it. I met a young man one time at an event, I, I remember, where our band was ministering, and he came up and he told me that God had spoken to him about using social media to, to teach the word. And now, again, millions of followers and little bite-sized, little 90-second videos of him just reading the Bible and talking about it. And all this Gen Z and millennials are just eating, you know, eating it up, reading, hearing scripture all the time. God wants you to imagine and think through what you have to do, right? The stay-at-home mom who says, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to meet at the park, and we're going to listen to this podcast throughout the week, and then we're going to discuss it at the park as our kids play. She was thinking through. She was nudged by the Spirit. And there's a ton of moms who do that sort of thing. Think, nudged by the Spirit, thought through, what can I do in this season I'm in of mothering these, these little ones? And then God uses her. How many of you think that's awesome? Right? To make disciples. Moses used his staff. Disciples used what God put in their hands. I want you to also think through in new ways to be open to what you have to think through. Okay, so I want to give you a story of a friend of mine. It's actually my dad's best friend. His name is, is Chuck. Pastor Chuck has been a great friend of my dad for as long as, I can, as long as we can remember, probably 20 years. And Chuck was praying. He sa kept saying, God, I'm just, I'm not. And he just shared this story in front of all these pastors. This is exactly how he says it. And he, he even shouted behind me at the pastor's event we were just at last week. They celebrated. And he's like, yes, I love it. It was so interesting he, he, he told a group of pastors that he, he didn't, something wasn't working with the way God wired him. And he was kept asking God, Lord, I just, I want to be pastoral, but I don't want to lead the whole thing. I, I don't want to, uh, the leadership stuff is, is too stressful for me. It's not the way I'm wired, but I want to keep shepherding. I need you to make a way. Well, then he approached this church who said they were on the campus. And he asked them, he said, hey, just bring me on staff and just, like, take our church and just make it part of your church. And they said, okay, we'll pray about it. Well, like, three months went by, six months went by, nine months went by. And then they were in a staff meeting, and their new discipleship director, his name is Anthony, he said, hey, what if we actually take up Pastor Chuck on his suggestion? And they're all like, well, I really like Pastor Chuck. Let's talk to him. Let's, do, let's, let's interview him. Let's see if this works. They just became a campus. Pastor Chuck... The pressure of leading all the things is off of him, and, and he loves it, and they're grown. They've already, he was just saying they've almost doubled. Listen, here's, what, here's the point. He could have said, this is the way it is. This is what I've always done. You see what I'm saying? But instead, he's like, I'm going to think through what God's speaking to my heart. And now more people are hearing the gospel. And he is fulfilled and he is happy as a lark. They celebrate from the stage and he actually shouted. He goes, I love it. <laughs> you know. And he was talking to me in the foyer. He said, I literally, I, I marry people. I counsel them. I help with funerals. I visit them. I pray for them. 
and I get to do all these shepherding things, and he, he just loves it. Who is it? I'm going to read a verse to you, and then we're going to close. I went off script a lot, so I'm gonna, hopefully I can use a lot of this next week. All right, here we go. Proverbs 10, if you got your Bibles, I want you to write down or go to Proverbs 10. I'm going to give you a verse that jumped out at me that I, I've read a lot of these kind of verses in Proverbs. There's actually a lot in there about diligence. I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to look for the noun, okay? All right, Proverbs 10, 3. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son that brings shame. Here's my question. Who is it? Is it the Lord or the diligent man that made the man successful? Oh, this is a little tricky. Some of you said man. Some of you said, oh, who said both? Somebody give her a Snickers or a $5 bill or some sort of prize. It's both. Let's read it again. The Lord, ever say the Lord, does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent, ever say the diligent. Now, wait a minute. That's you. That's me. That's the Christian who thinks through what he has to do. I'm going to give you a really simple illustration, right? This is, this is simple. It's not rocket science. Kendall back here. K Kendall, can you raise your hand? I know. You didn't know I was going to call on you. Come up here. No, I'm kidding. You don't have to come up. All right. So Kendall, Kendall, Kendall said he felt a nudge in his heart. Um, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, right? He felt a nudge in his heart to join the worship team. Is that right? Okay. Then he thought, I should apply. Who thinks that's good? I mean, we, we don't say, hey, anybody has an instrument, join the stage. You know, we just come on. <laughs> Got a tambourine? Come up here. No, we don't do that. Thank the Lord. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. <laughs> All right. He set, up a, he set up a meeting with Will. Right? He thought through. And then, and then did you practice? Okay, please don't tell me you just wing it. He's like, no, I wing it. Okay. All right. Kendall, don't blow my illustration. Did you practice? Okay, let's give him a hand. How many of you guys today enjoyed Kendall's ministry? But here's what a lot of Christians do. Lord, I ask you to just download. <laughs> Charismatics, you know, right? Just download all the musical notes into my brain as I lay against this music theory book, right? And we do these silly things. Instead of thinking through, what do I have to do to follow through on the thing God is asking of me. Amen? And then you live in that place of fulfillment, that place of meeting and moving the kingdom forward. I want you to bow your heads. I know for some of you, and we're going to talk about the imagination a lot more next week. I want to invite the prayer team to come up because I feel like some of you might, it might be really good for you to simply tell someone what you're thinking through. I got that advice years ago, and it is absolutely true that if you vocalize that thing, you are much more likely to take a step in the direction of it. Okay, so if God is trying to increase your faith to say yes to something, by the way, can I say this? Don't overcomplicate it. As you're, as you're imagining right now, as you're thinking, and there's for some of you, you know, it's like you might be complicating it, and, and you're already coming up with all the reasons why it won't work. Again, I remember with that, with that real estate thing, I remember telling God, well, I don't have the money to do that. I don't know how to structure a loan. I don't know how... I'll, and then I had, to, I had to push those excuses aside and say, well, God, will you teach me? God, will you teach me? See, childlike, right? And then I remember the excuse, well, God, I don't have the time to do that. And then I felt like God said, well, hey, I'll bring you the right people. I'll bring you people that can work, create a little team. 
See, we come up with all these reasons. I don't have the money. I don't have the people. Listen, if you just say yes to God, you will be shocked what he is able to do on your behalf. What he is able to do to propel you forward into that thing. Think through this pursuit of God. John Piper says this, the pursuit of God engages the mind. The pursuit of God engages to the mind. And so for some of you, you, you do have something already in your mind that you're thinking through. For some of you, it's a business. I remember Andre Venzel, every time he was here, he would prophesy. This, he would always say, out of this church will come a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners. And that's true. That's already been fulfilled. But this, this is a moment when the Holy Spirit's reminding me of that word. That that was a promise. That was a, it was a, a spoken message from heaven to us as a people. And so if you're thinking, man, I, I do actually have this little business idea. I've been considering it for a year or maybe five years, but I've been afraid to start. I want to encourage you to just come up to a prayer team member. Or if it's simply a dilemma that you know you need wisdom on, like we talked about at the beginning of the sermon, and you say, I want to come before the throne and ask. I have a dilemma. It's an interpersonal relationship at work or this thing going on in our marriage, whatever it is, prayer is just asking God for help, for wisdom. James 5 says that he will not turn you away. He shows no favoritism. It's one of my favorite verses. That if you need wisdom, you can ask for the wisdom. Why don't you stand up to your feet all together, and if you want to come forward to a prayer team member, come on forward. Don't be shy about it. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean you won't, won't be there for an hour. And you can take a, it can take a moment. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else who says, you know what? I need to ask for some wisdom. Do you know the wisest person yeah, is the person who asks for wisdom, <laughs> right? That's what wisdom is. It's the fear of the Lord. It's admitting that we don't, we don't have all the answers, and sometimes we just need help. And it's one of the most beautiful things. I love seeing these prayer partners filled with people. This is beautiful. And if there's not somebody available, you can pray right there. I actually want to do something I did um, two weeks ago. Maybe it was last. No, that was a picnic. Two weeks ago. And I want to just have a moment to pray for each other. Just a moment, okay? If you'll just keep your eyes open. If you, if you just say, hey, I don't want to divulge everything I'm thinking through, but I am thinking through something, and I need wisdom for it. Can you raise your hand just right where you're at? Yeah. All right, now, keep your hand nice and high. Can everybody else just surround them? I love that many of our leaders and pastors are raising their hands. That, that shows me the wisdom, because wisdom asks for wisdom, to ask for help. Yeah, Catherine, yeah. Turn around and pray for these guys, okay? There you go, yep. Yeah. Go up to these people. We need some people to surround Pastor Jason. He needs a lot of wisdom, a lot of help. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Come on, guys. Come out of your cheek. Tim, Tim, come on up. These guys help. Surround. Let's surround our pastor, young adults, and youth pastor, and let's just ask God. And again, they don't have to divulge anything. Just, just pray for them. Just put your hands on their shoulder. Ask God to give them wisdom. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Again, if you're not getting prayer, just stand in agreement with someone. Stand in agreement with someone. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you for wisdom from heaven, God. Wisdom from heaven. I want to say this. So I really feel the prophetic in here. So if you want to prophesy to someone, and that just means speak, you know, what you believe God would want to encourage them with specifically, go ahead and do that. Share that with them and just, like we've taught, you don't have to make it weird. You don't have to say thee, thou, thine. You don't have to change your language or personality. Just be yourself and let the Holy Spirit flow through you. Encourage somebody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For those of you that are done praying, I just want to leave you with this thought. In the morning, wake up and ask God, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to think through today? What do you want me to think through? And if there's a big project, think through what are the steps you can start to take towards that. I bless you, Rock of Grace, with a wild imagination to think creatively like the Spirit does, to let the Spirit touch your mind. If you want to receive this prayer, just open your hands. I, I, I ask that. I ask that the Spirit of God give you incredible creativity to do what God's asking you to do. And I ask God to give you the courage to try new things and not fear failure because you already know how loved you are and failure doesn't define you, and the outcome of a venture will never define you. Your Father already defines you. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Minister.